Hello you guys, my name is Dr. Talia Marcajani and I'm recording to you guys from my clinic in Bloor West Village. It's called Bloor West Wellness Clinic in Toronto, Ontario and Canada. And today I want to talk to you guys about how a gluten sensitivity might be the underlying cause of your mental health conditions or other inflammatory conditions such as arthritis and migraines and digestive symptoms like IBS. One of the reasons that I'm recording this video is because gluten is a really hot topic in the, the health and wellness industry and you've probably encountered your own versions of gluten-free food or articles on the internet about how gluten is this evil toxin. And there's a lot of misconceptions around this, and so I'm going to just talk a little bit about what gluten is and my own journey with cutting gluten out of my diet and sort of how I came to that, that space where I was willing to do the experimentation and cut it out and, and see what my results were. So gluten isn't a toxic substance per se. I mean, there's some opinion around this in certain circles based on what it can do and how it affects the immune system and the results it can have on digestion if you have a sensitivity to it. But what gluten is, is it's a protein complex. So it's a bunch of proteins that's found in grains, wheat, rye, and barley. And the protein complex is consists of different proteins called gliadins. So I might use gliadin and gluten interchangeably. It's the same thing. And so there is a health condition called celiac disease that's a very serious health condition and it's an autoimmune condition where the body attacks an enzyme called transglutaminase that's involved in processing gliadin molecules. So this is, it's not a reaction to gluten per se, it's an autoimmune reaction that's caused by uh, any, that, that's caused anytime the body comes into contact with gliadin or gluten. And celiac disease is a very serious health condition. It affects about 1% of the population, but there's some room there for, for debate. So some, some people think that you can acquire celiac disease as you go on, and there's evidence for that. And also they, some people think that there's a, a, a grand underestimate, underestimation of how many people are affected uh, by celiac disease and that the number is higher than 1%, but a lot of the cases go undetected. And so celiac disease is diagnosed by blood tests for looking at transglutaminase or endomesial antibodies, but the gold standard diagnosis is doing an intestinal biopsy, so that's how you find out if you have celiac or not. So some people have done a blood test and they, you know, tested negative for uh, celiac disease but are exhibiting some of the symptoms, and so an intestinal biopsy will tell you yes or no definitively whether you have it or not. Now. Whether you know someone with celiac disease should or should avoid gluten or not isn't really the debate here. I mean that's obvious. So if you have celiac disease, you have to avoid gluten 100%. It can't even be in your diet. You can't even have a crumb of it. You have to use special toasters or toaster bags for your gluten-free toast. You have to make sure that your oatmeal hasn't been contaminated by gluten. You can't shop at Bulk Barn because there could be cross-contamination with gluten-containing substances. So this is it's almost like an allergy. Like you really have to be careful about coming into contact with gluten. And when people avoid gluten if they have celiac disease then that disease is managed so whether someone with celiac should avoid gluten or not is not up for debate what is in this gray area and that's what you'll be reading about online and what you'll hear certain professionals say is, is kind of myth and, and is is this idea of non celiac gluten sensitivity gluten sensitivity these are people who don't have celiac disease but for one reason or another, notice that when they take gluten out of their diet, they feel better. And when they reintroduce gluten, they feel worse. And the symptoms are complex, just like in celiac disease. So in celiac, I mean, people can get rashes, they can get joint pain, they can experience brain fog, they can experience uh, brain damage, they can get arthritis, they can start getting other um, conditions such as thyroid conditions. And so the symptoms are so widespread because of the inflammation that's triggered by eating gluten. And this is also the case with celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So these are people that avoid gluten. So my story was when I was a student at the naturopathic college 
one of the things that I was exposed to in first year was this idea about elimination diets and leaky gut, which I'll explain in a bit more in depth, but you might have heard me write or talk about leaky gut. And, you know, and this idea that things like gluten or dairy could be contributing to some symptoms that I was experiencing and that a lot of patients were experiencing and um, and that taking these foods out in a systematic fashion, so doing a really clean diet or a hypoallergenic diet or a diet that's basically chicken, rice, and maybe some spinach, that that would heal a lot of the complaints that I and many others were experiencing and that, but probably gluten was implicated in that. So I was really resistant to this for uh, at least two years. So I wasn't an early adopter at all to this idea. A lot of my classmates like got the information, they went out and they started eliminating, you know, a lot of these foods from their pantries and trying elimination diets just for fun. Well, for fun and also to experiment and, and to heal themselves and to, you know, walk the talk as we say. But I was living with my Italian grandmother and I would have toast for breakfast, I'd have pasta for probably lunch and dinner, I was getting gluten in my diet a lot and the idea of taking it out and resisting those familial pressures was I just didn't want to deal with it but throughout the first couple of years of school I was also getting migraines on almost a weekly basis and these migraines would take me out for the entire day so for the, the entire day I'd be throwing up lying in the dark with a cloth on my head trying to take some Advil or something to mitigate it, but um, this was a chronic thing that I was going through. Best case scenario, I'd get these once a month, but they were th things that I was getting often. And I also, you know, had this lifelong problem with bloating and this, this kind of like IBS symptoms like gas and bloating. And when I first started the naturopathic college, it was amazing to me that that was something we were talking about because I'd kind of written that off as just being some Thing that you know a peculiarity a particularity about my body that I just have to live with and it didn't even occur to me that something that wasn't considered a disease per se could be something that warranted attention and that you know had a treatment that went along with it and a cause so I was kind of intrigued by that idea like oh you mean I don't need to be bloated and and that even though I'm not sick, like I'm, I'm healthy, I don't have a disease, I don't have high cholesterol or some kind of autoimmune disease or, you know, type 1 diabetes or something like that, but that the idea that an imbalance or symptoms that were uncomfortable could be treated was totally new and exciting for me. And then, so there was this intrigue in being gluten-free, but also this resistance to it. And then I think I was at a talk at school where we were given, it was a, a it was a sort of an information session about detoxing, we were given free samples, it was a seven day detox that involved shakes. And so I did that because I had this free box, probably worth about 80 bucks, and I decided, okay, well I'm going to do this detox, like it'll be good for me, it'll be sort of my introduction to eliminating a lot of these foods, um, it'll be easy. And it was really difficult. The first few days I had massive headaches as I was, you know, withdrawing from a lot of the things I was addicted to, such as caffeine and sugar and probably gluten as well. But that sort of set the stage because I felt a lot better after that process, even after that, only that week of eliminating the food. And so when I started introducing the things I was eating normally back in, such as pasta and bread, I felt a lot worse. So that discrepancy kind of woke me up to maybe these foods aren't that great for me. And then I began a process of elimination um, and noticed really good results. I mean, I don't get migraines anymore. Uh, it's very, very rare and it'll be a combination of weather and other factors and stress and overwork. But that once a week or even once a month being in the dark with a cloth on my head, no noise and vomiting all day, that that those are, that's in the past. So, and then, you know, when I reintroduce gluten, I can maybe tolerate a little bit of it, but uh, I definitely notice a difference in my energy levels, in my digestion, and just in my mental functioning and in my mood when I, you know, make a habit of having it more often. So I'm basically grain and gluten free and have been so for about four or five years. So why is gluten bad? Like, why gluten? Why is that an issue? So, I mean, the obvious answer, right, is that it's so present in our society. So in North America, gluten is one of the main staples in our diet. So like, you know, pasta for lunch and bread, you know, a sandwich for 
dinner and toast for breakfast or cereal, right? Like we were getting gluten as a main source in our diet as in, in wheat very often. And so when we're exposed to certain foods continually, we become more susceptible to an immune response against those foods. But also gluten has, I mean, we see in the mechanism of celiac disease, there are these, this genetic predisposition to react to gluten. And so um, on immune cells, and we know that our immune system or our digestive system, sorry, our digestive system is the gateway between our bodies and the external environment. And so how our immune system kind of educates itself is by sampling things from the environment and deciding what's us, and we shouldn't attack ourselves, right? Because that creates an autoimmune issue. What's us, what's ourselves, and, and what's food, what's useful to the body, what's supposed to be incorporated into the body as fuel, and what is not helpful for the body, what is toxic, what is foreign, and what we need to defend against, right? Like bacteria and, and bacteria and viruses. So our immune, our digestive system is kind of involved in sampling from the environment, deciding and, and showing that those pieces of the environment to the immune system and letting the immune system decide what it's going to do about these things, right? So when we're eating foods, we're kind of presenting them to the immune system. And our immune cells have different little, like, receptors so they're called receptors but they're sort of like they, they, you can describe them as like you know locks for keys or little sort of antennae that feel out the environment and so people with the receptors they're called hla dq2 or hla dq8 receptors on their on their immune cells those people tend to react and to connect those receptors with gliadin molecules, so gluten molecules, and then, and that signals an immune response from the body. And when the body thinks it's come into contact with something that it needs to trigger an immune response against, so that means something foreign, something, something threatening to us and to our health, then an, a whole inflammatory pathway starts to take place, right? So think about when you get a cold, you get, you come into contact with, contact with a virus and the reason that that virus doesn't kill us is because our immune system reacts to it when you get a cold you know depending on what virus you're in contact with you might get uh you know the, the swollen throat and the pain and maybe a fever and maybe some mucus production some runny nose you might feel tired because it takes a lot of energy to mount an immune response like that right so when we're experiencing inflammation it's really useful for us because we're killing out the things that could kill us you know, basically we're at war with something from our environment, but it also doesn't feel great to be in that state. And so we get into trouble when we're in an immune, when we're in an inflammatory state and it's not for the right reasons, like that we're trying to attack something and get rid of it. So a lot of people have these receptors. And so even though only 1% of people react to, to gluten in, in the sense of celiac disease, about 30% of people express these HLA, DQ, two or eight receptors on their immune cells. And so, you know, coming into contact with gluten on a regular basis could be problematic for these people and that could trigger some inflammation. Another thing that gluten does is creates a leaky gut situation. So I've talked about leaky gut before. We have these our, our, our intestinal cells, so you know, our intestine is this long tube from our mouth to our anus and it winds around and it you know, goes from mouth to esophagus to stomach to small intestine, large intestine, and then rectum and anus and different things happen along that process. And in our small intestine, we have these really long, they're kind of like um, cylindrical cells. And on one end, on the end that's in contact with what we eat, there's these little fingers, these villi, that reach out into the environment and that maximizes our ability to absorb the things that are good for us, the foods that we eat. And in between, so the, the, the villi kind of control, like, okay, we're gonna break down the carbs and we're gonna break down the amino acids you know, from proteins and we're going to break down the fatty acids and we're going to, you know, absorb all of the ions and the minerals and the vitamins and we're going to control how we take them in. We're also going to control how we take in 
foreign substances because we're going to remember show them to the immune system to take a look this is kind of what's in our environment this is what you guys might need to prepare yourselves to defend against if this becomes a problem for us and so we really control tightly what we're taking in through our intestines so our intestine you know it, it doesn't want to just kind of let like open up the gates and let whatever is outside in it, it's really like it's got these really specialized mechanisms for letting certain things into the body. And so between these intestinal cells, you imagine these kind of like cylindrical cells, almost like your hand with little fingers, and they're lined up all along your intestine. And between them are something called tight junctions. And so those, you know, they might become more or less permeable depending on the state of the gut. And that's controlled by something called zonulin. And zonulin will open up that permeability and kind of let things in between the cells. And lower amounts of zonulin will maintain a more closed environment. And so one thing that gluten has been shown to do, or gliadin, is increase levels of zonulin, which open up our intestine to the external environment. And think about the things we eat. Think about the things that we swallow by accident or intentionally. The things in our environment that are toxic, you know, or giant pieces of protein from foods, right? So protein in and of itself can cause an immune reaction. Like we have children that are deathly allergic to peanuts, peanut butter and other nuts. So it becomes problematic when we have all of this stuff just kind of entering our body. And so gluten kind of opens up the gut to allow all these things to enter the body. And so we, we end up mounting immune responses to things that would otherwise be harmless to us you know like dairy or eggs or you know those kind of things that are actually nutritious and helpful for our bodies so we we start to enter this state when we're when we're, when we're in a leaky gut state we start to enter a state of inflammation and inflammation has widespread effects in my case it was migraines and like bloating and digestive symptoms and like a foggier kind of mind and foggier brain and lower mood as well and in some people it could be bipolar disorder it could be you know worsening of symptoms on the autism spectrum it could be depression and it could be anxiety when we're in that inflammatory state we have higher amounts of something called they're like excitotoxins or endotoxins. So these are toxins like lipopolysaccharides that are LPS as it's mostly, as it's most often referred to. And this is, these are things that are, they trigger anxiety, they activate the limbic system, they activate the amygdala. These are our fear centers in our brain. We also have something called the blood brain barrier. And that's really similar to the intestinal barrier with the tight junctions. And that prevents things from getting into our brain that are in our bloodstream. So it's like we have this second wall of defense because our brain is so important to our survival and like fluctuations in our brain chemistry have really disastrous effects. So we have this extra sort of layer called the blood brain barrier that prevents things from getting into our brain. And when we're in a high inflammatory state or when we're exposed to gluten, we get these cross reactions where what keeps our blood brain barrier intact starts to separate. So we get this leaky brain picture. So we've got a leaky gut and also a leaky brain happening. And so we're getting these toxins and we're getting inflammatory mediators entering the brain. And more research into depression and other mental health conditions has shown that inflammation might play a giant role in low mood. There was one study done with patients who were hospitalized for bipolar disorder. So these were people that were in a psychiatric facility and they measured their blood for antibodies against gliadin. And they found that there were elevated antibodies in these people. So there wasn't a control group. They weren't testing against sort of a non bipolar or people that didn't have a bipolar diagnosis but they found that every single patient who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was hospitalized, so their symptoms were severe enough to require hospitalization, had elevated levels of antibodies to gliadin. Then they retested them some time later and found that having, an, having high levels of gliadin or even further rises in gliadin antibodies predicted whether they were re-hospitalized. So we can infer from that that their symptoms worsened 
And so we know that there is this connection between mental health conditions, you know, depression and anxiety, and bipolar, and even psychosis. So another sh study showed that there were high levels of antibodies to gliadin in people who had psychosis and psychotic symptoms. So we know that there is this connection with mental health and with inflammation, and that this inflammation can be worsened by you know, a gluten sensitivity or gluten reactivity that maybe 30% or more of people are susceptible to reacting to gluten in some kind of way. And, and that gluten might just in and of itself cause this leaky brain situation or leaky gut situation. So one thing I do is I don't, I don't do this with every single patient that I see who comes in with depression or anxiety or stress. I mean, I don't jump right into like prying gluten from their hands because my own experience was that it took me literally two years to think about removing it and I had to kind of come to it on my own. But I might plant the seed or we might do something like a trial run where, you know, especially someone who's, who's, who's got mental health symptoms or you know is coming to me for mental wellness and they also have digestive symptoms i mean those two things together are a clue that doing some elimination diet or some leaky gut healing or removing foods like gluten could be a good idea but you know i might present the option to them you know we we find that most treatment really does need to have a hundred percent compliance rate so you you know, you can, like some patients will come back and be like, you know, I kind of took gluten out, maybe 70, 80%. And that's really great because I think it sort of sets the stage for creating a gluten-free lifestyle or doing a gluten-free trial. But really what the research is showing is that we need to 100% take it out to allow the gut healing and the brain healing to occur and to lower those inflammatory mediators. But the good news is that it usually takes about two to four weeks to get symptoms to really come down. So. It's not like you're on this trial for life and you know you can go back to your past. If you don't know anything, if you don't notice any change after two to four weeks at all, then you can go back to your pasta with the peace of mind that this isn't an issue for you. But if you do notice some improvement after removing it, then it, it is something that we can investigate either down the line when you're ready or something that you might want to consider. It's sort of like planting that seed. But I don't pl pry gluten out of um, you know, my patient's kicking and screaming hands. It'll be something that we might work on down the road um, and something that's always kind of on the table or on the back burner for future attempts and experimentation. And so the gold standard when it comes to treating sort of gluten sensitivity is just to do an elimination. So take gluten out of your diet for about a month, 100% out as best you can. There are blood tests that you can do and those can show an elevated antibody response to gluten or gliadin and wheat as well as other foods. So I, the one I do on my patients is about 120 different foods and this is great because having a piece of paper that shows you what your immune system is dealing with in the moment that you got the blood work done is useful and people tend to, you know, when it's a blood test, it tends to hold more authority than simply like, you know, the subjectivity of symptoms, but really the best way to see how gluten affects you or how certain foods are affecting you and your immune system is to do an elimination diet, remove it 100% from your diet, give it some, give your body some time to heal and then reintroduce it and see what it does to you once you've, you know, healed from the state that it's put you in, right? And you know, really doing that removal is important because the antibodies is only one part of the immune system. And so when I've done a, a food sensitivity test on myself, I, I felt crappy because you have to eat the food for a while. So I was reintroducing gluten into my diet and I didn't have high gluten antibodies. I had antibodies to other foods, but, it, but not gluten. So I kind of like psychologically was like, well, I guess I'm okay to eat it then and went back to eating it a bit more regularly and then experienced really terrible symptoms and my mental health took a decline and then it was like okay I had to take it out again so the labs don't necessarily tell the whole story what does tell the whole story is it are your symptoms and so so taking gluten out for two or four weeks is 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 what I recommend most people do and so how do you take it out so you know I mean the really what the goal is because 
and I'm, I'm saying this piece now because there were some articles that were floating around, it was a few months ago, but I'm sure they're still around with like, going gluten-free is unhealthy, it's dangerous. And I was really confused by that because I was like, it's not like weed is this like really important food in our diet that's giving us all kinds of nutrients. I mean, we fortify grains with things like folic acid and other B vitamins like riboflavin, but you know, they're not super nutritionally dense and it's not like we have, um, you know, a calorie deficiency where we need to get more carbs and calories. I'm not telling people I'm not telling people to avoid spinach, you know, or something that is really giving them a lot of nutritional currency. So, why would it be harmful to take gluten out and then I realized how it's often being taken out right so you go to the grocery store and you find there's like a whole gluten-free section and you basically have like you know gluten-free breads um, or like gluten-free Oreo cookies and you know those gluten-free Oreo cookies are, are for like celiac children that want to join in with the rest of the group right they're not like oh I'm eating these gluten-free Oreo cookies these are a healthy choice that I'm making it's like a, it's a it's a substitute right for um and otherwise, it, well, for a junky food, you're substituting one junky food for another junky food, but the only thing is that you're still maintaining your gluten-free status while on the, 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 uh, the substitution. And when it comes to like gluten-free breads versus whole grain breads or whole wheat breads, like probably whole wheat breads have more nutritional bang for their buck, they're higher in fiber, they have a bit more nutrients, and you know, gluten is a protein, which is why it causes the immune the immune system reactivity that it does but you know if you don't react to proteins they're healthy for us and we need them because they contain the amino acids and they fill us up and they do all the other things that proteins from other foods do so you know usually gluten-free bread doesn't have very much very many proteins in it so yeah i mean if you're choosing between nutritionally uh nutritional value of a gluten-free bread versus a uh, whole wheat bread, then the whole wheat bread is better for you. So we see this in people that do gluten eliminations and they're kind of like, okay, I'm going to take my wheat pasta and I'm going to have rice pasta instead. I'm going to take my gluten-free toast in the morning or my, you know, gluten toast in the morning, my wheat toast in the morning, I'm going to put gluten-free toast instead. So that's not the healthiest way to go about it. It might be a good way to transition when you're trying to do an elimination. It gives you peace of mind. It allows you to still have your Oreos if, you know, it's, it's not creating a giant change, that could be helpful. But really what we're aiming to do is not just substitute, you know, wheat products or gluten containing products for non gluten containing products and leave it at that. We're trying to shift into a more traditional diet, you know, like a Mediterranean diet or a paleo diet that's higher in the fruits and the, and the vegetables and that's higher in the healthy fats and that's more protein rich and that the proteins are from better cleaner sources. So that's the end goal, right? So it's not that we're happy with, you know, patients eating rice, flour, and tapioca bread. Like, it's about switching to a cleaner and, and more sustainable diet that our bodies evolve to, to thrive with. However, the immunoreactivity of gluten is really what we're trying to deal with when we're going on a gluten-free diet, especially the two to four week trial run. And so what you're doing in that two to four week period that's allowing you to stay off gluten is, you know, if that involves gluten-free rice bread, then that's that's another story. And that I think, you know, as a naturopathic doctor working with people who are struggling to, to get rid of gluten and see if that's an issue for them, I think that's okay for the short term. So it's not that going off gluten is bad for you, it's, it's how we do it, right? Are we changing our habits for better ones or are we kind of sustaining some of the same standard North American diet habits and just cutting the gluten out and thinking that that's healthy for us so that's going to cause weight loss or whatever. No, this is a different thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about gluten as a, as a root cause of inflammation that then leads to psychiatric disorders such as bipolar depression and anxiety. And so one thing I'm going to say as well is sometimes it's not enough just to take out gluten and so what I do or other foods that are suspect, right? So dairy could be another culprit in this or, you know, things like eggs or soy. Or there's many things that we could react to, but we often start with gluten. So just often taking the food out isn't enough and we need to do some gut healing with things like L-glutamine, which I mentioned in my amino acid talk, and also restoring the, the probiotic balance. 
and and doing some things that are just helping repair the gut you know getting digestion back on track getting your digestive motility moving through things like digestive enzymes and bitter herbs and things like that and so i'm just going to mention three probiotics that have been shown they're called like psychobiotics <laughs> or nicknamed that because of the beneficial effects on mental health and in another lecture i was also talking about how the probiotics in our gut are also responsible for producing serotonin that our body has available to it, which we know is like the happy hormone. That's what the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work on. So, you know, getting the right balance of bugs in your gut could be just as effective potentially as taking an antidepressant medication. So that's really cool. But the three bugs that a lot of research has been done on are the lactobacillus casei, bifidobacteria longum, and Lactobacillus helveticus, which has been shown in studies to actually decrease anxiety and to lower levels of cortisol, which we know is also implicated in depression and anxiety, and probably other more, more serious psychiatric disorders. So, I hope that was enlightening. So, I mean, we talked about how gluten can contribute to inflammation, leaky gut, and thereby exacerbate or create mental health issues how going gluten-free is not the same as going whole foods and how you know going uh, gluten-free might be the answer or at least part of your um, self-care process in healing from mental health conditions so thanks a lot guys have a hope you're having a good new year good 2017 and i'll see you soon my website is taliaandy.com and you can contact me at connect at taliaND.com. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I focus on mental health and I work in Toronto, Ontario at Bloor West Wellness Clinic.